first, uh, first course, first semester, I really struggled to make it because I read half as fast as everybody else. And I'm so focused on the letters that I can't remember what I've read. So I need to read it twice, which means everybody else reads four times as quick as me. I had to struggle like a crazy to make it. I did, but barely, and I figured this is not going to work. I can't do three more years of this in this way. And in the first course of the second semester, we had had this group um, work. Uh, we had a problem with the group because, of course, I hadn't been able to read everything, so I didn't really understand that we were quarreling within the group. And we go up to the, to the teacher, and the teacher goes up to the wall, and he takes a pen and paper, and he scribbles an X, and he does that, and he does Bob, and he... And BAM! I don't have to think in letters and words. I can think in pictures. And from that day, I, um, I had A, straight A's on almost everything for three and a half years. And I did a semester X at Lynn University in Florida. I did two MBA courses at Harvard University, international business and doing business with Pacific Rim countries. Turned out I wasn't an idiot at all, as they had said. I was dyslexic, and which is just something that some people are. Um, but it was really, really interesting for me because I really had until that thought that I was idiot, an idiot. Um, and maybe I'm exaggerating a bit because I know, of course, I wasn't an idiot, but I really felt that I was not as smart as the average Tom, Dick and Harry. And after my university, I still had a bad, I almost had a feeling of I'm actually cheating because I'm not remembering all this in words and I'm, I've got a picture of a of a model in my head which explained things for me, but I'm not gonna tell anybody I'm cheating. Um, and, um, and then I finished in 1992. And in 1991, we'd had a financial crisis. A, a, it was called a Fastihetsbubla, real estate bubble. Um, I didn't know what I know today, that there are no uh, real estate bubbles, there are no IT bubbles, there are no anything else bubbles. It's always financial bubbles within different types of sectors. It's greedy banksters who beat the shit out of hard-working entrepreneurs and people in general. <coughs> and, um, but we've had one, and Sweden had gone from 1% unemployment to 10% unemployment. So there were absolutely no jobs for newly educated um, MBAs, and specifically, specifically not for somebody who was almost 30 years old and never had a real job. Um, so I started a company, I went to Russia, and um, I had this idea. So Sweden was almost a communist country in the 70s and the 80s. Strongly socialist. And people loved Russia. They almost knew the words to the national hymn. And, and the big bastards called, you know, Ronald Reagan and bar for the capitalists. And I remember the first time I came to America, I bought myself a, what do you call this, a vest that you can shoot people in? And like a police vest and a helmet. And I wondered if I would survive getting in from Newark to Manhattan. Uh, it, it was a complete, it was a complete sensation to me when I come to paradise. Nice, clean, I didn't see anybody get shot, shot the whole summer. Um, and, and then when I came to Russia, I was expecting, wow, from one paradise I'm going to get to another one. It's just as good. And I come to an armpit. And I'm not talking a nice armpit like from a 15-year-old girl who shaves it. I'm talking like a lumberjack armpit who's been out working for 14 weeks week, with a lot of hair and shit. Russia was the worst place I had seen in my entire life. But I had this idea. 1989, when Russia collapsed, and Sweden, who loved Russia and Russian things and, you know, and communism and stuff like that, I figured they would love to buy Russian trash. And the Russians would probably like to keep, throw away any trash that they had and could get rid of. So I figured I'd go there, I'd buy trash for about maximum $2.00. And I'd take it home and I'd sell it on auctions in Sweden because the Swedes would oh, this is a Gorbachev chair. This is the chair, how it looked in the, for five years during whatever, Brezhnev. And um, so I bought, and the, the most successful thing was I bought something for one dollar I sold for $650, um, which meant a thousand products a week. I could have made a good business on that. Problem was that I had this guy, Sasha, working for me because I didn't speak any Russian who was supposed to buy the stuff. And he came to me with fantastic stuff like, you know, these uh, things that Stravinsky had had and a leather etui with a gold emblem for $2. Uh, beautiful microscopes and stars for $1, $2. And I said, this, you know, I need a thousand products. I want trash. I want an ashtray, a broken chair. I want 
anything you can buy, but a thousand products a week. And he said, I don't understand. You've got to come with me and show me. So we go to this place um, in St. Petersburg, which looks like Östermalm in Stockholm. Where I don't know, with, 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 basically around here. Beautiful, nice Jugend houses, you know, large, built in the late 1800s with parade um, flats, 250 square meters and uh, beautiful places. And the difference between Stockholm, where a family would live in like that, was that when you come into a Russian one, 75 people live there and like dogs and terrified of each other looking out through the doors like this and the, it was amazing how poor they were and i go into this small room called jungfrukammer in swedish and norwegian i think as well and this old lady said you can pick anything you want in this room for one dollar a piece and i go in and there's probably value in there for a million 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 maybe two million kroners they were so poor they would sell anything they had and I didn't go to Russia to become rich on poor people. So I left 2,000 products in a warehouse in St. Petersburg and went home totally depressed and decided and promised myself to bash socialism at any given occasion I could for the rest of my life, which I have and still do, as you will see. Um, because socialism doesn't work and capitalism does. So um, I come home, I'm depressed, I'm sitting down on the sofa and the telephone calls, actually first day I come home from Russia and it's Jan Steinbeck. And Jan Steinbeck, who I'd met on a boat in Barcelona during the Olympic Games, said, you were going to start working for me. And I said, well, you never called. And he says, I'm calling you now. And I said, when do I start? Tomorrow morning. So I put on my great suit. And I go down to the office in the morning and I meet John Steinbeck. John Steinbeck looks at me and says, no, 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 no. You can't look like that. And I said, what do you mean? He said, no, you've got to have jeans and a T-shirt. The T-shirt has to be dirty. And I said, why? I said, because you're going to build a, a chain of shops for TV shops products. Trash that doesn't work and that are really, really cheap because they don't work and it's trash. Um, and you have to look trashy to be able to sell trashy stuff. <laughs> and I went like, I've been studying four years, I got half a million kroners of student loans. I mean, I'm, and now you're going to give me this. And he says, Johan, everybody who starts, starts for me needs to start with carrying beer. And if they're good at that, they can start off, stop off as a CEO for any company I have at the organization. And I figured life's not fair. And this guy, his name was um, uh, Kalle von Sprett. You know, he was actually a phone as well, but with a real one. And his father and Jan had gone to school together. And he went straight into Hipsburg Art on the head office and worked with mergers and acquisitions. I had better degrees. I was more ambitious. I was actually smarter too. And he had a much higher salary. And there I was in my T-shirt and my, my shitty jeans. And I said, and this is also really, really, really important. I said, nobody, I'm going to beat von Sprit. And nobody is 20, is nobody, I'm going to work two hours more than everybody else. I walked first into the office in the morning and la when the last person went home, which was different people every day, I put on the class day for another two hours because said nobody is two hours smarter than me. So if I work two hours more, I'd win. And um, my first thing was I was going to build a chain of shop for three months. I was finished in two and John was out traveling. And at the same time, I was sitting, <coughs> I was um, uh, sharing office space with the ZTV, which was like MTV, Music Youth Channel. And it was chaotic, like crazy. They didn't know who, what, what was their target group. They didn't know what type of programs they were going to do. They just, it was just a playground for doing television because Jan had a, he had a license and he didn't know what to do with it. And I hadn't had time to think about it. So I did a marketing plan for it. I said, this is the target group we're going to have. This is how we're going to produce it. And um, I did all that when he was there. And when he came home, he says, this is great. Now you're the marketing director of ZTV. So, um, and, I, and I, we had 6% penetration in Sweden. And he says, well, your goal is now to get it up to as much as you can in, in, uh, in a year. Um, and you have no money to do it. And I said, okay. <laughs> But it was so much fun because, you know, if Madonna came in for a concert, I'd take her out to Cafe Opera and have champagne with her, and which was great fun. So it was, a, it was a fantastic job. But I had to be really, really innovative and see how could I get people to actually sign up? Because at that time, it wasn't just plugging in the TV and you put on it and you had all the channels. You actually had somebody sitting behind the TV 
turning it into stop stop a little bit back a little bit back you have to find get every channel into the tv so it was a hassle of making people actually to go through the process of getting through to the tv so i did crazy stuff and uh, since we decided it was going to be a youth channel i worked with rfsu get a corner for sexual or something whatever and we gave out condoms and on one side of the condom packet is a ztv and on the other one say can you get it in um, uh, <laughs> because, you know, they had to get it in for, for the wind. And, and um, hugely successful, spread them out to all universities and high schools in Sweden. This was in the, age, the year of the AIDS, so they gave away these condoms very... Uh, they liked doing that. And um, I also did, I took a, took a baker, um, and in, during the weekends, because we didn't have money to send a television at the time, Fridays and Saturdays, we took out my office desk, we put in a bed, put up a camera, and we had the baker sleep in my office from Friday afternoon till Monday morning. And he could only leave if good to go to the to toilet, he would have to eat pizzas, and he could sit there and watch television. And people would come home and say, have you seen, have you seen the baker? What baker? He's on television. And they would sit there and watch him, you know, and he was lying there, so sleeping and scratching and really fun, crazy. And a lot of the real reality sopas were actually invented during this, peri um, this period on ZTV because we wanted to get people to produce content that would engage people and make them look. And we did um, a 48 hour um, discussion group with the same panel, which was hilarious because after 48 hours, they were getting really tired. <laughs> And we would discuss 48 different subjects and people could walk in from the streets and participate, sitting in an audience like this. And the, both major magazines in Sweden, Express and Afterblad, had the whole Löpsedel, I don't know what that's called in English. Flyer. The flyer was all about this program. Both of the two majors said, this is the craziest program you've ever seen, you've got to go see it, it's still going on. Um, and on the Saturday night at three o'clock in the evening, we had this guy called Hugo Hugo Dahlgren, which was a very famous Swedish weightlifter with a lot of humor and looked crazy. He had said something really, um, um, what's the English word? Um, not so nice, it was not really, it was just provocative about, feminine, about lesbian women. And at three o'clock at night, they called me up and they said, Joan, there's, a, there's been a disaster. Hua Hua Dahlgren said this and that, and now we have 15 militant lesbians knocking on the door, wanted to come in, what do we do? And I said, for God's sake, let them in and call after Mladet. And so we got another flyer the next day, showing, talking all about this amazing event. So in six months, I got it up to over 80% penetration from six, seven, without a dime in marketing. So Jan said, this is fantastic. You're such a great guy. I'm not gonna make you executive vice president for a bank in Luxembourg and you're going to be responsible for co-branded credit cards and you're going to live with me in my house. So um, I started off to 20,000 Swedish kroners. I invoiced it from a, from a company called NFT, which was uh, no fucking tax, but Bahamas registered. <laughs> it prescribed by now. Um, and I then moved to Jan in Luxembourg and I had 350,000 Swedish kroners tax free. I lived in his house for free. I had a sports car convertible with a special motor from Audi and a big fat representation account. I had kicked from Spritz ass. Yeah. And how had I do it? done it? By working two hours more. If you work harder, you win. Now, if you don't want to win, don't work hard. But if you want to win, you work harder. It's as easy as that. It, to be honest, Many, many times we're not talking two hours. We may be talking like nine or ten or at least five and seven. I put that up as uh, lesson number two. Good. Yeah. Lesson number two. Work hard, you succeed. Nobody is two hours smarter than you, regardless uh, of everything. So I had kicked ass. I felt really, really successful, really, really rich. I had actually I forgot one company in between there. Before the bank, I actually, he, he calls me up when I was at CTV and he said, I want you to start a teletext production company. No, actually, he calls up and said, Johan, you're doing a great job. You're going to leave CTV. You're going to become CEO for your first company. And I go, yeah, nine months after university, CEO for my first company. I said, what am I going to do? He said, teletext. I go, do you know what teletext is? Yeah, the older group does. Yeah, I forgot it. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it's so unsexy, you can't even imagine. <laughs> and he says, well, the problem is, Johan, the TV4 in Sweden, which I own 25% of, 
has installed Teletext and they're making a shitload of money on it. And I own 100% of TV3 that doesn't have a Teletext. I need you to put a Teletext on it that is better than TV4. So I want you to go around Europe for one month and find out everything there is and then come home and build the best Teletext in the world. And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm a, and this is lesson number three then. I said, John, I'm a technical idiot. My father has called me that since I picked up a, took apart a, a bicycle and never got it together again. You know, I got my thumbs in the middle of my hands. I can't, this is not me. And he says, Johan, any idiot can learn anything there is in three months. You're not an idiot, I'll give you one. <laughs> but that was an astonishing experience for me. Because you know, for the first time in my life, I was brought up thinking that the smartest people are the doctors and the civil engineers and, you know, mathematics is really important and blah, 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 blah. And suddenly he says, after studying four years at university, any idiot can learn anything in three years. I, uh, three months, I am 100% convinced that he is right about that. Because if you think about how much you actually need to know to be perceived as somebody who knows anything about anything, <laughs> in three months you can easily do it. And that's enough. Because all you have to do is to make the other people think that you actually know what you're talking about. <laughs> because it's all bullshit. It's all about hard work and commitment and passion and energy and, 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 and the rest of some, you know, I'll get back to the smart people. But for, for, for the time being, that was a big harvest. So I traveled around Europe for one month, literally one month, sitting in a hotel room, sapping text TV on hundreds of television channels. And I go back to Jan, I said, Jan, I got good news and bad news. Well, give me the bad news first. Bad news is TV4 has got the best teletext in the world. And there is no way that we, through the satellite um, television channel, which TV3 was broadcasting from London, can make a teletext that's better than the one that they have here. And he said, that's really crap. So tell me the good news. And I said, well, instead of stealing from the large world to teeny weeny itsy witsy Sweden, Let's steal from Tinuini to Sweden and spread it out to this large world. And he said, do you really think you can do that? I said, give me one month. So, long story short, I do uh, the first contact with Teletinko in Madrid, which was then the second largest television channel in Spain. Um, made it quickly the largest teletext production com uh, uh, company in Spain because of the teletext. In six months, I started teletext production in Norway, Denmark, Sweden. Uh, Holland, England, Italy, Germany and Spain built the largest teletext production company in the world and made f 5 million euro profits a year for 10 years although I was only there for year, the first year myself. Um, and th there was something really interesting there in, in that process because of what I learned there was that Sweden had fantastic engineers really really good on technology but fucking no ambition no interest of going abroad, of internationalizing, of spreading this. They were so fat and happy with making teeny weeny pits of money for TV4. Actually, they probably made quite a couple of million Swedish kroners, but you know, not at all what they could have done if they would have gone international. And um, so Jorn then calls me up, gives me this job in Luxembourg. I become what I thought was really rich and really successful. So Jorn and I had been out drinking whiskey a night. We're standing in our underpants in the kitchen four o'clock in the morning. And I say to Jorn, I say, Jorn, how much money do you need to be rich? You know, I wanted him to tap me on my shoulder and say, Jorn, you're rich as hell, you know, because I felt so. And he said, wow, 50 million? That was such a shock to me. I almost fell to the floor. I said, 50 million? Yeah, 50 million dollars. I was thought it was talking Swedish kroners. <laughs> I said, 50 million dollars, what the hell do you want that for? He said, well, you know, you need an apartment in New York, one in Paris, summer house in Saint-Tropez, something in the Alps for skiing, maybe a farm or two, cars, jewelry on your wife, paintings on the wall, your kids in the right school, it goes fast. <laughs> I was kind of, you know, like, uh, so when you, in Sweden there is a saying, when you talk to the peasants, you have to talk like a peasant. So, you know, I said to you, but John, fuck, I want to become rich. How can I ever get $50 million? Then he taps me on my shoulder. He says, Johan, stay with me for 10 years. I'll give you $50 million. That was a great time to resign, wasn't it? 
So two weeks after, I didn't have the balls to do it right then, I had to think about it first, but two weeks after I resigned. Because I figured, you know, he, it's not like he's a charity guy. He's not going to give me $10 million or $50 million because he likes me. It means I'm going to bring in $250 million to Shinivik at least. And if he thinks I'm so good that I can bring in $250 million, I don't need to work for anyone. So I resigned. <clears throat> and um, I was going to start a company called uh, Speed Ventures, who would benefit from my experience from the Teletex company, finding really good Swedish or Scandinavian technology and spreading it out of Europe. Um, so I called my best friend up, Eric Wikström, and I said, Eric, I'm going to start a company that helps companies in Sweden uh, internationalize. And he said, I'm just going to jump off Shinevik and start a company doing web pages for companies. If you internationalize my company, I'll make you equal partner. And that was a company called Icon Media Lab. And I said to myself, I needed to make more than $50 million in five years. I didn't need $50 million. I'd never had that as an ambition in my life before. But because John had said I could get it from him in 10, I needed to do it for myself in five. It was just a competition against the promise that John had given me. So I went out in our first press release and I said, we were four people, we had no money, we had no customers, we had no nothing. And I said, we're going to become the largest internet consultancy company in the world and I'm going to make more than $50 million in five years, just to put some pressure on myself. And of course, people laughed at me. And, um, um, and uh, five years later, we had 3,500 employees, 32 offices in 21 countries, and was the largest internet consultancy in the world. On the way, in 1998, I also started the first sharing economy company in the world called Let's Buy It.com. Let's Buy It.com. Sorry? What did you call it? Let's Buy It.com. Let's Buy It was a consumer aggregator. So if all of us wanted to buy a Volvo, we'd go in and we'd buy 32 Volvos, we'd get a much better price. And it was for two years the largest e-commerce site in Europe. Put it public on, um, so Icon Media Lab was public on Swedish stock exchange and on Nasdaq in the States. At that time, that was completely separated stock exchanges. So I actually rang the bell at Nasdaq on live on CNN. Company who had a market value of $2 billion. Let's buy it.com was started in 1998. We put it public in 99 with 1,000 employees in 10 countries. Uh, had a market cap of $1 billion. And I started a company in 98 called Speed Ventures with some friends that made the largest private placement in Europe in 99, 200 million euros. And uh, was valued at over a billion euros. And um, um, I had kicked ass on von Splittenstein um, by working a bit harder. And I had my personal uh, value at the, at the end of 1999 was about 6 billion Swedish kroners. So I actually kicked ass on the... 50 million um, that Jon Steenbeck had offered me as well. There's not that many people who's made 6 billion Swedish kroners in five years, but there's fucking nobody who's lost it in six months. <laughs> so when the internet bubble burst, I kind of, well, you know, it just poof, and it was all gone. So easy come, easy go, uh, but a lot of fun and a lot of work and a lot of experience during that time. Um, and I was, during that time, I was really, really engaged in bashing, bashing socialism in Sweden. It needed to be bashed, and I bashed it really hard. Um, why? Because Sweden had no entrepreneurship at all. Um, we, had, we had more multinational conglomerates than any other country in the world per capita. ABB, uh, Volvo, Saab, Ericsson, Ektrolux, endless amounts of them. But absolutely no entrepreneurship at all. In Europe, on average, there was 15, every fifth, was 15 percent of the population in Europe were entrepreneurs. Only 10 percent in Sweden. Now, sometimes I ask the audience, say, so how many percentage? What was the difference between Sweden and the rest of Europe? Or they say five percent. But the difference between 10 percent in Sweden and 15 percent in Europe is 50 percent more entrepreneurship in Europe than in Sweden. That is insane. And it's absolutely, it's not that you know that just happened. It was created that way. It was created that way by socialism. And um, because no entrepreneurs, or very few entrepreneurs, are, entrep are socialists. And socialists want all people in the society to be socialists. So they had made this deal with the Wallenbergs and the others who owned most of the conglomerates 
because the Wallenbergs didn't want any competition from entrepreneurs. They wanted everybody to work in blue, blue stoats and walk to the office and press buttons and pull and then go home and lie on the sofa and watch tips extra and then vote red. Everybody was happy. About it's just that we weren't happy. We had the highest suicide rate in the entire world for a decade. We weren't happy. Now it's lesson number, what are we, five? Uh, up to three now. So here's a question that is so obvious, you're all going to accept and agree with me, and when I ask you, nobody's gonna know. What is the most beautiful thing, the most fantastic thing in the world? Freedom. A child's smile. Close, you're closer than, you're, you're close, because it's like, uh, freedom? Capitalism. No. <laughs> but you're, you're closer. What is it you feel for your child? Love. Yes, Love. it's always a girl. Oh, I didn't hear it. You have to shout. <laughs> love. Is, you're right. It's always a woman who says. Sometimes. Yeah. So love is the most fantastic thing. Everybody agree? No, but yeah, somebody. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. But it's not always up here, is it? No. Love isn't always up here. It's not always peak, peak, fantastic. No, Kids run out from, in front of cars. That, absolutely, but that that's, doesn't take away the, the beauty of it when it's good. Kids run out in front of cars. People get cancer and die too early. My wife can run away with a golf instructor. At, at, these, at these situations, life can be horrible. But what happens is that it's so good when it's here that if she runs away with a golf instructor, give me half an hour, I'll down at high risk looking for a new one. So because we strive for this, and it's a human right, isn't it? Everybody should experience love. Does anybody not agree with that? I agree. Good. Now, here's the difficult question. What's the second most beautiful thing in the world? Entrepreneurship. <laughs> because, because, if you love your children, your wife, your son, your daughter, your neighbors, immigrants, your friends, if you love everybody, you need also to love yourself. And when you have an idea, when Greta has an idea, Greta wakes up in the morning, she goes, Busse, I got this idea, I want to start a company. And Busse goes, oh my God, Greta, you got this beautiful job as a cashier at the bank, and we're saving all the money to go to Lanzarote this week, and we can, no, 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 don't get that out of your head. So disappointed, Greta calls mother and father, and my father says, my Greta, after all these years of studying, you're going to throw it all away on entrepreneurship? So Greta goes to her friends. Now her friends are so terrified that she would actually succeed, especially in Sweden. So, so they will go, nah, that's too late, too fast, too little, too strong. It's already been done, it can't be done. Everybody goes, it's gonna tell Greta, it's not gonna work. But Greta's got this idea. And it's growing on her like cancer. And you know, she's, she can't get it out. She know she loves, she wants. And one day she says, everybody else is wrong. Greta can, I can my, and she just fucking does it. Takes the step. Beautiful, isn't it? Yes. And that's, how many in here are entrepreneurs? Good, beautiful crowd. Most beautiful people in the world. <coughs> because they are the only heroes in society. They are the foundation of the society. If you ask a socialist, they will say, no, it's the workers. I work for the Landsting. Do you have a Landsting in Norway? Yeah. Like a hospital that's owned by the government. So they'll say, yes, but who's paid for that? Well, tax money. For whose money? For the entrepreneurs' money. Or the people working for the entrepreneurs. The first entrepreneur, you know, for thousands of years we lived in caves and we pulled our women home like this and we clubbed each other with big wooden sticks and ate like animals. And then one day this guy said, I've had enough of this collective shit. I'm going to go out and I'm going to become a farmer and I'm going to grow my stuff. And for all the excess that I grow, I'm going to change it for, and I'm going to employ people. And I'm going to... And from that day, 2000 years, we go to the, we go to the moon and so we're on our way to March, Mars. Entrepreneurship is the essence, the only thing that pushes us forward, that solves all problems, that will continue to solve all problems, and I'll get back to that too, which is fantastic. So, 
Kepa is now determined she's going to start the company. Um, let me see where I am. It's so long time ago since I did this. I'm going to do a pause. I'm going to show you how entrepreneurship works. And an entrepreneur is a typical left brain type of a right brain type of a person. Um, really, she's optimistic, positive, creative, uh, um, happy. It says yes to life. Actually, this is, I'm not used to working such a small thing, so oh, I gotta do this smaller. So it's a really happy person with a small brain, because not always, a, it's, yeah, it's true, it's not always the smartest guy cookie in the street, but always happy, optimistic, positive, creative, um, big smile says yes to life. And on the other side, you have uh, the really smart person. Um, with a big brain, um, analytic, um, smart, high IQ, um, says no to everything, because <laughs> because you know they know everything is going to not going it's not going to work. So, and oh, I hate the working on such a small thing. Um, and the she, Greta says, you know, all I need is this much money, and weeps, it's going to go this good. They all, I've seen 4,000 business plans presented to me. They always look like this. I have never, ever yet seen a company that has that development. They always look like this. And the only time you ever need pie in your life is that 3 times 4, 3.14 times, times as long as you thought, and 3.14 times as much money as you thought you'd need. That's the only time you'll ever need pie. And that's how it always is. Because this is how it goes. Yoo-hoo! We got our first customer! Shit, they didn't pay. yoo <laughs> We got our second customer! Bloody deliver so they just don't deliver. yoo We got a fuck the machine just broke it. Every shit that can happen to an entrepreneur will happen to an entrepreneur. What did I tell you? It's not going to work. Yes, this time she didn't pay, but the next one will. And that's how it works. And you know, it goes on like that forever. So when Ericsson's cheese, the fabric and cheese that burns down, what they do is they just move it to the factory in Taiwan. But we don't fucking have a fabric in Taiwan, do we? When our factory burns down, it bloody well burns down. And then you need to be incredibly optimistic. And then again, well, I'll build a new one. It's not going to happen again now, is it? How likely is that? <laughs> Problem is, the, 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 how, how does this guy get the money in the first? Ingvar Kampra does. Ingvar Kampra. You know who Ingvar Kampra is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He gives the money here. Now, why the hell does Ingvar Kampa do that when he knows how difficult it is and how much these knows the money? Because he knows they're probably never going to make it. It's so difficult that if I give it to him, at least I'm going to have my money left. If I give it this, it's gone. So, but we're in a big problem because without the money, we can't build our companies. So remember what I said before, if you talk to a peasant, you need to work like a peasant. So what you need is a really good business plan. You need a really good marketing plan. You need a really good finance plan. And a really good PR plan. And a really good HR plan. And a really good blah, blah, blah plan. And then, when you have all these plans, this is what happens. This guy goes, trick, trick. Because what they really love, they love Excel. How do you spell Excel? E-X-L-L. C, whatever. So he goes, check, 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 check. And now he's getting a little bit happy, a little, little bit happy. And he says, OK, now the, here comes the biggest, most difficult question. What EBDA are you going to have year five? Then as an entrepreneur, you've got to be really cool, say 17.3. And he goes, yeah, yeah, here, get the money. And you can finally build your company. Now, is it going to make 17.5 five years down the road? <laughs> we all know that's not going to happen. Because the only thing we do know is that nothing of this is going to be right. Doesn't mean it's not important to do. Alvin Toffler, I think it is, said, 
plans are nothing, planning is everything. These plans need to be redone all the time and adjusted to the experience that you learn in the way. It is an important process because they are right. Because if we give all the money to this person here, she's going to blow everything on the first marketing plan. We need, no human being can work with just, live with just one half of the brain. We need both sides. As individuals, as groups, always. So the boring person is right. The funny person is right too, but in another way. And this is really, really interesting. The thing is, when it comes to being smart, the smartest, but when I, when I lecture at, uni, at technical universities, I, I, I talk with a very broad accent, you know, like this peasant that I am from a small farm in the middle of nowhere in the south of Sweden. And I stand with my back to the audience and I go, it is incredible, it is incredible. Here I am invited to KTH, the most prominent uh, engineering school in the world, more uh, Nobel Prize winners than any other place. And I'm a peasant, ADHD, dyslexic from Sweden. From Hans is going to lecture to you. I don't even understand what it is I'm rubbing out from the table. And they, 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 they all sit there and I say, see, how many in here think it's impossible to have a high IQ and be smart? Half of them put up their hands. I said, come on, you're at the best school in the world. And they all put up their hands. And I say, you're all fucking wrong. It means absolutely nothing. I'll tell you why. You're all going to work, wind up working for guys like me. And it's true. The smartest people, how many in here are civil engineers or engineers? Only two, one, one and a half. Most of these guys, they are much, much smarter than me and the rest of you guys. And they have known it since they were this small because they came home at the age of six from the first mass test and said, I had all right on my test. And mom went, ooh, and they called grandma and grandma and said, oh, when I see you, I'm gonna give you a hug. And their whole lives has been like that. <laughs> Me, I came home and got, <laughs> go to bed, no food. <laughs> That's not funny. That's horrible, but true. <laughs> it is funny. I was just joking. Was so, <laughs> sorry? It was your way of telling us. Yes, yes. I've got to have some energy in this. So the thing is, all their life, and they come to KTH and say, welcome to KTH, the most prominent engineering school in the world, and you are so smart, and you're going to have the best. And, and then they study there like crazy. They have no fun, because they're not very fun, because they, you know, they like math all the time. I mean, how many here go, let's have a really good Friday afternoon and do some math together? <laughs> you know, it's, it doesn't work that way. And what happens when they finish? They get really boring jobs and small cubicles in Shista, right, long far outside Stockholm, where they sit and do maths all day. So it, you're not a winner because you have an IQ. You're a winner because you work hard, because you're ambition, because you can be passionate at what you do, and that you really work on your social skills. So, what did I want to say about Greta? Yes. What do you need to become an entrepreneur? Come on. What do we need? Courage. Courage. Money. That, you're right, but it's too early. You're not supposed to guess that right now. So, no, 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 Brian. <laughs> no, you, you need an idea. Yes, you need an idea. Does it need to be a good idea? No. No. Look, if somebody would have come to me 25 years ago and said, Joe, I got this really good idea. I'm going to sell slalom sticks to women at walking. What, 25 million pairs of slalom sticks later? There are no stupid ideas. If you can just sell the shit, if you can just get somebody to buy sticks for go, going out walking, you know, anything goes. Okay, so how many in here are racists? <laughs> it's so funny. You know, both Norway and Sweden has 25% of the voters voting for racist companies, and there's never anybody put up their hands when I ask that question. <laughs> Okay, so no racist, thank God. This, that is, this is a selective group. 
Perfect. That's, that, that's, that's not the reason. Nobody ever puts up their hand when I ask that. <laughs> Which is good. So then we accept that a German, a France, a Norwegian, a Swiss, an Indian have exactly the same amount of ideas, don't they? Because all we need is an idea and we, we're, we're just as smart, so there's nobody who has more ideas. Are we, can we agree upon that? Which means we should have had exactly the same amount of entrepreneurship because all you need is an idea. Are we right? No. Sweden had 10% unemployment and Europe had 15. 50% more than Sweden. Is Sweden more stupid than other people? Yes. <laughs> How can I be so stupid to ask that question in Norway? Of course we are. Of course we are. All right, so let me answer that question. No, we're not. He's racist. Yes. <laughs> no, he was joking. <laughs> okay, so in that case, something else is missing. If an idea, if, if we have the same amount of ideas, but we have 50 or 33% less entrepreneurship in Sweden, something else is missing. What? You said it before. Courage. Yes, courage. 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 Because everybody, remember, everybody told you you can't. Mother and father, your husband, your friends. Somebody thought, but you can always go to the bank. <laughs> uh, let's not joke too much here. So everybody's going to tell you you can't. Then you need the courage to actually take the step and do it. Greta needs cojones. Okay, well that makes it easy then. That means Swedes are cowards. Genetically born as cowards? No. No, exactly. Well done. Thank you, Norway. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't have been rowing around the world together with Norwegian Vikings if we were cowards. So what's happened with our, our guts? It's, culture. it's been still stolen by us by socialism. By the fucking welfare system, which I don't know. What is welfare system in English? Welfare. Welfare. welfare system. By the taking care of, don't believe in yourself, just work and be obedient and do what you're told. And they stole our courage. The Jantelov is part of it. It's a part of, that's a socialistic PR theme. They stole it from us and deprived of us the second most beautiful thing in life. The ability and the experience to take personal responsibility for your own financial needs. The ability to go for your dreams and do what you really want. I hate them for that. I went three and a half years at an MBA educational program in Sweden without ever once hearing the word entrepreneur. It did not exist in the Swedish society. And John Steinbeck changed that. He crushed the radio monopoly, the TV monopoly, the media monopoly, the telecommunication monopoly. He killed state-owned monopoly after monopoly after monopoly and just preached entrepreneurship. And I love him for that. And I took on that vow to continue to fight against socialism and spread the evangelism of entrepreneurship, of individual freedom, freedom of the ability to experience the second most beautiful thing in life. So the IT bubble burst in my face. I go skiing for two years, as one do. Um, and then I went back to Sweden. And Sweden had gone, because sweet, the end of the 90s was fantastic in Sweden. With companies like Icon Media Lab, my own company, Speed Ventures, uh, sorry, uh, Spray, which was another successful internet company, Framtidsfabriken, with a number of success, people started dreaming again. Do you remember Altitude? Altitude, of course. I worked there. Oh. Uh, Altitude was, you know, it went from zilch to a billion dollars in uh, two years. I had options. Congratulations. No, because you didn't get out. <laughs> yes, I had uh, 300,000 uh, Swedish crowns. So yeah. It was, uh, it was a fun ride. <laughs> I have a friend, but that's a longer story. But so but these success cases changed, started changing the mentality of the Swedes. Then when the internet bubble burst, the socialistic government went out and said, oh, what did we tell you? Entrepreneurship is just crap. You're just going to lose your money. It's all going to be horrible. Go back to your 
big uh, jobs in the OBB and, and the mines and you know and they put this wet dog uh, field tuned field the dog blanket over entrepreneurship and killed it again and I came back in 2004 and I looked at the society and I said for God's sake it was not an IT bubble it was a financial bubble within the IT sector look at what's happening in Silicon Valley look at what's happening in Norway you bounced back twice as fast as Sweden did but because you didn't have the politicians saying that you know entrepreneurship was bad look at how it went so I started an incubator again called iCube um, and first I'm gonna do a little bit I'm gonna show you what I did when I started Icon Media Lab so I said we started Icon Media Lab in 19 in the spring of 1996 and um, at the same time America had 3% of the population were on the net, Sweden had 5%, so we were slightly more. Uh, but you know, it was non-existent. And uh, the Swedish communication minister said that internet is just a fly, it's just, you know, it's going to come and go. And I said, no, I think the internet's actually going to go from 3% from, um, to 95%. It's going to go from .com to .mom. And .mom was when my mother was on the net. I said, when well, my mother is not a big consumer, um, but she, when she's on the net, she's going to be the last one in. And when everybody is there, including my mom, it's going to be a highly strategic product for every company in the entire world. And I said, okay, so if the goal is to get my mother on it, what needs to happen then? And I said, well, at the time, all we had was communication. And I said, well, oh, so, sorry, information. And I said, well, we'll be able to get answers as well, so it will be communication. And then I said, well, once we've added communication, we'll add transaction. And then I said, once we've added transaction, we will probably do integration. We'll integrate into the existing business plans and business systems and processes in order to be able to create more interactive deals, like going into your bank and actually uh, paying your bills. Um, and I call this, and I said, so the next stage there will be uh, participation. Uh, participation. And participation, sorry, it was so long since I did this. <laughs> Integration would be, we would actually participate, so, sorry. Hmm, never mind, I'll get it right eventually. We said we, have to, we will participate in the value creation by going into the bank, paying our bills ourselves, actually cutting away one of the people working at the bank doing this traditionally we would stand in a line waiting to have this done for us we would participate and do this work ourselves but we would still perceive it as a better service than having to stay and waiting in a line to get it to get there and then we said the next one was when everybody is participating in value creation it means everybody is going to compete with everybody and everything so let's say that you're Goodyear and um, um, we call that star, um, so now I remember, that's participation. Sorry, 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 sorry. That's participation. And then we said, we put one star and we said, that was integrated, that was participation. Then we said Star Wars. So we said a star, value creation was when everybody participated in the value creation. So you try to own your customers from cradle to grave. We would make sure that we would, a car company would build a small car for the teenager, larger for the family, a big sub, and then eventually a small car for the, the, the retired people. And, um, and, and we said when everybody is participating in this, everybody will co compete with everybody. So if Goodyear works with Ford and Ford and, um, and um, Avis is renting out Fords, it means that Avis is actually a competitor of Michelin tires. Everybody will compete with everybody. We call that Star Wars. Oh, yeah, Wars. Um, and then we said, at that time, individuals will be totally crashed in the middle because everybody will try to own us. Um, and, and I said, if everybody owns us because they want to be able to force us to be within their value star, we're going to lose our integrity. And... I said, what well, digital footprint, we need to own a digital footprint, our digi digital personas, our digital identities is not the same as a digital identification. It's actually the identity, who we actually are. And if it's owned by these companies, we'll be enslaved. 
but eventually we'll actually pull out <coughs> and we'll make sure that these stars work to our benefit and nothing else. And I call that me star. And then I said eventually we'll be able to have a lot of different situations like this where we will all run our different stars that we are interacting with in different ways and we'll do we star. We star will be that I will use my discount on Volvo and give it to you for your discount at SAS. And we'll force these stars to work on our premises because the man, the human, the individual is the important thing in the system and not the technology. This I did in 1996, which is really interesting because at the time we just had information. So when Google came out in 1998 and said, make no evil, they had already started at this part. I call it the most evil company in the history of mankind. In 2002, I invested in a company called A Small World, which was one of the very first social media companies that was successful because I believed this would be the foundation of a platform which would own and control ourselves. Then Facebook came along in 2004, and I said, this is going to become the most valuable company in the history of mankind because they own our souls, our digital souls. And this is now the most evil company in the world, even eviler than Google. Um, I have a tweet from 2009 where I said it's just a matter of time before Google and Facebook determines the outcome of a, of a political election. Um, so I was a fanatic driver against privacy on the net. And I'll get back to that if I have the time. <laughs> so I said that, well, the internet, in order for this to work, technology, obviously, it's, it's a lot about technology. It needs, the technology needs to work. But we don't want engineers to decide what's going to be done because they will do things, oh, nobody's done this one before. Yeah, but why? I don't know. Um, so we needed behavioral scientists who would say, where's the problem? Who, what, what is it you really need? And then we'd go to the engineer and say, can you actually solve this problem? And then we would need creative people to say, well, how can we educate people to make them understand how it will work? How can we make it funny and intuitive? And, and then we needed management consultants who would say, how does this play in, in the overall strategy of the organizations and their overall looking goals? And how can we implement this structure to support that? And then we needed, uh, we call it HCI, which is human computer interaction. And we needed project leaders um, because these people, you know, the engineers, they go like this and they don't want to look people in the eye and just send the emails to each other. And the behavioral scientists, you know, they would stand and talk to themselves in the corner and attempting to make them into suicide. And, the creative people would be dressed in black and throwing themselves like a crazy Liv Ullmann in the process. And the management consultant would be extremely boring with the tie, so type of, you know, like never had any fun when we were climbing trees, they were to do math with their father. So all of these people are crazy, like we all are, <clears throat> like we all should be. And we are worthless if we're alone, but fantastic when we're together. So we needed somebody who would actually run and conduct how such a meeting with these weirdos would work. What, do we, what problem is it we want to solve? Can it be solved? Can we make it intuitive to you? And can we make money on it? And that was an integration model, a mungfall, uh, what do you call mungfall again? What is mungfall in English? Um, uh, it's a diversity. It's a diversity model. The more we mix, the better it is. The more we integrate, the better it is. What does New York, London, and Singapore have in common, apart from being the three most richest cities in the world? They're the most cultural, integrated countries in the world, cities in the world. All religions, all races, all ages. The more you mix, thank you, sir. The more you mix, the better it is, the more successful it becomes. And it's fundamentally like that. So we built the cube, and because of that, I love this integration model. I've called all my companies cubes after that. So in 2004, I started iCube. iCube was an incubator done just to piss off the socialists in Sweden. <laughs> um, because before that, all incubators in Sweden had been based and locked to go towards the universities. And they were state-run. 
and they would have telecommunication at telephone plant close to Ericsson, they would have IT uh, in Shista, they would have biochemistry and uh, med tech in, in uh, and um, no, sorry, in Karolinska, and they would have something at the business for, for the um, at the business university, and they would never speak. Mm. And of course, so far away from the city centre world, the finance world, that they would never meet the finance guys. So I put my my eye cube smack in the city of city centre of Stockholm, right where all the businessmen, the finance, <laughs> the politicians, the creative people, the art directors were, and I combined all of these different types of of um, of um, entrepreneurs from different type of industries because said the fundamental of entrepreneurship is not the technology as such. If all of us are uh, entrepreneurs within telecommunication, we're going to recruit the same people. We probably have the same education and background, so our networks are identical. We're going to recruit the same people. We're going to sell to the same telecommunication operators. We'll re we're going to raise money from the same venture capitalists. How much are we going to help each other? We're going to sit like this, you know, we're going to... Instead, if we're all from different types of areas of the city with all different types of backgrounds and interests, our networks combined are huge. <clears throat> and there is no competition because we all need to survive so we can all help each other instead. And suddenly what happens then is that... <coughs> um, um, what was I going to say about that? Uh, yeah, I'll drink some while I think. Um, so by combining all of these interests and helping out, we find the fundamentals, not in the technology, but in the basic essence of all entrepreneurship. I need to survive, I need to raise money, I need to build my brand, I need to find customers, I need to recruit the smartest people. That is identical for whatever given part of industry entrepreneurship that you can imagine. And if those are the goals, and we all need different things, we can all cooperate and help. So that became hugely successful. I ran it for four years, and I had um, companies like Apotia. Now, these are Swedish companies, you won't know them. Apotia, which is the largest online pharmacy in Sweden, billion, uh, getting close to a billion dollar valuation. Exceed Broadband, which is the largest TV, uh, TV app production company in the world. They built Netflix. Uh, couple of billion Swedish kroners. Um, Starflow, which is, um, sorry, not Starflow, um, Snowfish, which is 50% of um, Spotify today. It's all the lists, you know, that you, that you create your own music lists. Uh, endless amounts of companies from the 45 companies that we had over four years, because that model worked. May of in the spring of 2005, it was valued at 500 million kroners. So I was on my way back. I own 51% of the company. And then Lehman Brothers go bust. <laughs> so I had to shut the company down in the autumn of 2008. I had also been in the cultural board in Sweden for six months and had 20 death threats. I was the first non-communist in the Swedish cultural board. So um, that rendered 20 death threats. So I decided to move to Singapore and start a company called MyCube. And MyCube was going to kill Facebook. This was now in 2009. MyCube was look and feel like Facebook. You owned and controlled all your digital assets. You had the ability with an integrated micropayment system to charge for that content at whatever price you just put down as, as you decide as a content creator. Um, and the company had huge success when we launched and then it was raided by the Russian mob. Um, and I lost, again, 500, 250 million kroners of my own money. And, and I was wiped out and I moved home to Sweden. It took me a year to get out of Singapore. And I moved home to my summer house in Sweden because that was the only thing I could afford at the time. I was there for a year, didn't find any jobs. Moved to Stockholm and started a venture capital company together with a financer who's PE background. Um, and he didn't put any money in on any of our investments. So after three years, we just shot that down. We didn't do any investments. And um, this is November last year. So for the last half year, I'm looking for something new to do. And I'm really eager to do, find something. Put my, I'm still full of energy, full of ideas. I just had some really tough turns. And which I think is really astonishing. Because, you know, people ask me, you know, are you happy with your life? I've had the best life in the world. I wouldn't change anything. I'm really, really happy with everything I've done. And this, 
it's not over till the fat lady sings. I know I still have the network and the experience and the energy to do it again. I just need to find the right thing to start working on. So that determines the, determines the first two parts of my presentation. Yes. So how long are you in uh, I leave tomorrow morning. How long can you okay. stay? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's this, it's, I can move here. <laughs> so it's this far from Stockholm. I can be here anytime. So. Good, let's speak, talk about it. So that's the first two parts. Where I'm from, why do I tell this part about my weaknesses? Because I don't care about them. I think that the weaknesses I have has given me the strengths that I have and I'm proud of my strengths. So I need to accept my weaknesses. But most importantly, I want to inspire people that if I can do it, anyone can. Absolutely anyone can do whatever they want. The world can be changed. That's important to me. The second one is, I want to talk about entrepreneurship, how fantastic it is and what ability it gives you. And I want to inspire people to one time in your life you should try. And even if you fail, so what? It's not the end of the world. Because it's the second most beautiful thing in the world to experience. Do you know, when you, after one year you wave away goodbye to your employees for over Christmas. Hi, goodbye, have a nice time in Thailand, I'll do inventories over Christmas. And they, and they fly away. Five years later you take your first vacation, you take your whole family and you go to Sora Sommerland. And, um, and five years later you, you, you win a gazelle thing and you, you, you see your products in the windows and you find, you know, at the peaks it is fantastic. It's that bloody hard work. It takes 10 to 15 years. It's three times, 3.5, 14 times as long time as you think. And every shit that can happen is going to happen. But at the moments of success, it is marvelous. And you need to experience that in your life. Um, so the next part is what's going to happen now? Where are we? Looks like shit, doesn't it? Well, I mean, anti-globalization, uh, anti-EU, uh, racism, uh, political um, uh, polarization, right and left. Um, it all looks like shit. And they have Google out there saying, oh, singularity. Uh, all digital um, technologies are evolution, um, having evolution in, um, what do you call it, uh, exponential speed. And as they do, they m merge. And when they do, we get disruptive. 40% of all jobs are going to disappear over the next 20 years, they said, almost 10 years ago. And they're all going to go out on the streets and they're going to burn cars and smash windows. We need to give them, what is it called? it? Um, uh, mm -hmm. basic income something global basic income yeah bullshit it's fantastic everything is fantastic everything's always been fantastic the thing is that people are negative especially specifically the really smart ones this really smart ones do you remember you remember i already wrote this picture for you huh? they say it's not gonna work not going to happen. Now the whole world is cooking. It's, we're all dead. It's just as but since 1970, 1750, when the industrialization started, absolutely everything's been, become better. There was a little, little here, the Second World War, six years. You know, it doesn't even show. Everything has become better. We live longer, we eat better, we don't get sick, kids don't die, everybody gets education. And you know, everything is fantastic. And all the time here, they've been saying, well now Diggerdurden is gonna kill us all, and now uh, Napoleon's gonna kill us all, and now uh, this is gonna kill us now. And now there is, you know, there's no winter for two years, and now, <laughs> and, and now it's the computers, now it's, do you know, uh, what the loop on the band? What do you call these? Um... Conveyor belts. Sorry. Conveyor belts. belts. When the conveyor belt came, that's what gave us socialism and unions. Do you know what the word sabotage comes from? Sabu. Sabu is a wooden cloth that workers in French used to have, and they threw their wooden cloth into the machines to destroy them. 
French people, yes. And they wanted, it's always the French. Uh, and they wanted the machines to break so that they could save their jobs. And then they started unions and socialism because they said, now with industrialization, we're all going to lose our jobs. It's all going to be horrible. And then we had, you know, and then we had, uh, what was it, next? PC, now it's, we're all going to die. And then was internet, and now it's, now it's singularity. But you know what? Statistically, I am right, and they are wrong. Human beings have an amazing ability to become creative and surprise people and surprise ourselves and to solve problems. Every problem that human beings ever had has been solved. <laughs> Everything since, 19, since 1750 has become better. Now, I remember in the 70s, they said, well, first of all, we're all going to die because of nuclear power. Um, and not to mention how much we were going to die of the nuclear wars that we were going to have. And then all the forest in Germany was sick and dying. There would be no trees in Germany. Have you gone through the jungle of Germany lately? <laughs> then we had the ozone layer. We were all going to burn. It was all going to burn. All going to burn. <laughs> there is no ozone problem anymore. We solve everything. Well, I'm not talking inside environment or environment work spaces. I'm talking about the environment outside. It's the only one detail that's worse since 19, 1750. I think he's completely wrong in that. I think it's absolutely man-made and that we're in, uh, we have a huge problem with it. But we will solve it. I think Greta Thunberg, the Swedish 15-year-old who's on every cover of every newspaper there is in the world right now, she's completely wrong. And the fact that she said, we shouldn't fly anymore. Of course we should fly. The more money Norwegian and SAS does, the more money they have to actually pay for the development that Boeing and, and Airbus needs to do in order to be able to create planes that will actually make a difference in the future. If we do not progress, we're dead. Because we're 10 or 20 million people in Northern Europe. It's a piss in the bucket compared to 1.3 billion Chinese, 1.3 billion Indians, 1 point whatever point billions rest of the Asia, and then another billion in Africa, and almost a billion in South America. And they are not going to stop flying or doing anything else to prevent themselves from increasing their life, to improve their life. It's not going to happen. The only way that we can save the world is by pushing down the pedal to the metal and have people, ingenious people, save us. And it will happen. Sorry? Save. save. It will happen. I'm not, I don't have a shred of a doubt. There's actually less desert today than there was yesterday. Because they are now so fast putting green grass on the desert. In China, they have, um, they have developed a technique to grow grass in salt water. So they are now being able to get more water out of um, uh, more food for people than we have ever been able to do before. If you look at Israel, the way amount of money that they desalt, the way the amount of water that they desalt and have made the whole part of, of Israel green could be exported to every part of the world if we just had enough money to do it or if we just put our money there. 20 year, for 10 years ago, I started joking, saying, well, you know, a 400-year-old mahogany tree will be able to be built, uh, grown in 50 years and 20 years from now. Do you know we're actually this close to getting to that? I said that as a joke, which means that in 50 years, the whole Sahara is going to look like the rainforest we cut down in Congo. There are no problems that cannot be solved. Number 11, we will solve it. Good! Lots of 11. I've got to see that list afterwards. <laughs> so, I was at... I, was, I, I love these type of conferences where intelligent people get together and talk and, and discuss. And I've been to the World Economic Forum four times. I was awarded Technology Pioneer by the World Economic Forum in the um, late 1900s. And now I'm not invited there anymore, so I go to Horace's global meeting, which is very similar. 800 people meet for four days. Presidents, finance ministers, NGOs, CEOs, entrepreneurs, creative people. 
and they discuss everything. And I had this huge aha experience when I was there. So I'm going to, going to help me out here. Um, they discussed augmented reality. Does everybody know what augmented reality is? No. Augmented reality is, for instance, you watch a movie, you stop the movie because you like the dress that your girls has, and you buy the dress, and then you continue watching the movie. Um, then you have virtual reality. Everybody knows what virtual reality is? Yeah. And then you have um, IoT. Everybody knows what IoT is? Yeah. Internet of Things. You can actually check what you have in your refrigerator over your telephone. Um, there you have AI, Artificial Intelligence. Everybody knows what it is. And Machine Learning. Everybody understands that. Yeah. Then we have, uh, out, no, we have uh, Open Source. We have uh, S uh, Sauce. We have uh, uh, what else? Um, we have uh, G5, um, 5G. Sorry, my dyslexia. Uh, 5G. We have uh, cloud. Um, any other major in technical parts? Blockchain. Blockchain, of course. Blockchain and crypto. Anything else? Good. Good. Sorry? So it's mixed reality between AR and Yeah, but you, know, we, we, but you know, this is good that you can come up with it because this is exactly what happened. So 800 people discuss politics first. All fights of politics all looks like shit. Then they start talking about technology and they say all of this technology, they all tried everything of this. They all know enough of it to discuss it. Right? Average age is probably 60. So I'm just below that 60 years age uh, medium of the group. And they discuss all of this. And they say all of these technologies are having exponential development. And as they do, they actually merge. And when they merge, they have, dis they have disruptive, uh, disruptive structures that happen. And that's what will create singularity problems. That's why 40% of all jobs are going to disappear. The biggest one, the biggest threat they see right now is that in seven, eight years, give or take, it's going to be prohibited to work as a transporter in the States. Because people driving lorries, or school buses, or whatever else, they fall asleep, they take a whiskey, they watch their SMS, <clears throat> and they have accidents, and they can only work for eight hours a day. Seven, eight years from now, it's all going to be automatically driven uh, transport vehicles that goes 24 hours a day and never drives on, to, ne never, never falls asleep and never drives on a kid. kid. Six, there's the largest group of work employers in America. Six million people are going to lose their jobs in one day. And this is just one area of industry. Uh, right now, we're, we're, the whole retail industry is actually experiencing a Kodak moment. And um, which is going to be much, much worse than what the retailers and the analytics at the banks understand. Are there any bankers in here? One, two, um, three. So, so anal analysis and bankers don't understand how bad the retail death is going to be. It's going to be brutal. Yeah, but even worse. <laughs> so a lot of things are going to happen here and they're not all going to be good. I said before that everything has become better. Absolutely, without any doubt, but not for everybody. And that's important to understand. If you lose your, your life your job as a, as a truck driver, you might never get a new job, which means the world probably just you know, became this bad. But it's better for everybody because we're not going to be run over by somebody who's been dry, drinking, driving, and stuff like that. So, and this is important. So one technology is missing here. 3D printing. Sorry? 3D printing. No, I can put 3D printing here as well. But no, 3D printing is not the one. Automatization is just uh, in everywhere. Implantations. You can put that in here. It's machine, machine learning. AGI, A, and I. Uh, general artificial, general intelligence, and neural intelligence. That wasn't discussed, but it's not the one I'm looking for. This is a PC. You don't need to guess anymore. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Video gaming. Oh. <laughs> Amazingly important. How can they miss that? I'll tell you why. Because they've never tried it. Yeah. And why haven't they tried it? 
because they can't. How many in here plays CSGO, PUBG, World of Warcraft, LOL, uh, or any of these games? I play games. <laughs> the, the ones, yeah, but you're, you're younger. But, but the games that I told you about now, do you play FIFA online on... Uh, uh, all, the, all the stuff, but I play games. Okay, which is very, very good. Why can't older people test these games? Because it takes a hundred hours to just learn how to move, pick up things, reload your weapon, shoot somebody in the face, run around the corner, they're shooting at me there. They, it takes a hundred hours <coughs> of practice just to be able to try. Why is that important? Because they don't understand, one, how incredibly difficult it is. Two, how amazingly fun it is. Three, how incredibly addictive it is. Four, um, how pacifying it can become. Yeah. Sorry? <laughs> no, but you know, we don't want six million truck drivers on the streets in yellow vests, burning cars and sort of throwing down. We want them occupied with something. So, and if they're having fun, and then five, here's the most important one. You can make money. Big money, but in a way nobody's really understood yet. So, what do we know about uh, blockchain and Bitcoin? How much dollars are there in Bitcoins today? Billions? How many billions? 256 billion dollars. 256 billion dollars. That is 50% of the Norwegian GDP. Actually more. Built up in the, took Norwegians, six, seven million Norwegians, 2,000 years to build. It's taken the blockchain 10 years. And 95, 99% of Norwegian GDP is in real estate, uh, forest, uh, and has nothing to, it is $256 billion liquid. It is insane amount of money. Who's got this money? You believe in Bitcoin? I can go get back to that. <laughs> <laughs> just curious. You, you can't kill $256 billion. It's, it's not a matter of believing. It's just a matter of accepting the fact it's there and it's never going to go away. Never going to go away. It's going to, it's, I can guarantee you, it's going to become much more than $256 billion, but then it might die. <laughs> but because if, if somebody moves it over to something else, if there's some other development, but I am as sure about cryptocurrencies as I was about the internet in 1994. Let's say that no Norwegians or Swedes, Swedes need it. We have had a 20% deflation over the last two years because of socialism. But Norwegian krona is strong like hell. You don't need it. But what about the guys in Zimbabwe or the people in uh, Argentina or Venezuela? They need Bitcoins and they will have it. Or India or China. Do you know China, they haven't changed any laws in China for 30 years. Do you know why? What they do is they just don't look at, you don't enforce the laws. Now the interesting thing with that is that every Chinese Absolutely, 100% of every Chinese has broken the law. Which means that the Chinese government can go any day up to any Chinese and put them away. How many in here knows the name of the Chinese president? One, two. <laughs> ah, cheat. <laughs> so three, four people. Of oh, the biggest country in the world. How many here can, can name the name of one Chinese athlete, movie star, pop singer, Businessman, I have one back there who is incredibly smart, but 99% of the population in the world has no clue. Which means that, well, for, we know Jack Ma of Alibaba, we know the other Ma of uh, Tencent, but that's basically all other businessmen, they just suddenly disappear. A lot of them just disappear and nobody understands, nobody knows, we don't read about it because nobody knows about China. Do they need bitcoins? Sorry? 
Absolutely. But back to the $256 billion, who's got this money? Where are they? Who's got $256 billion? Well, A, ultra-libertarians. People who have Ayn Rand as God and Atlas Shrugged as a Bible. You should bear, wear a gun so that you can protect yourself from other people's wearing guns. Uh, if you want to take drugs, it's your life, you depend on it. States should not defend in anything. They are the ones who built the blockchain, they are the ones who created Bitcoin, and they created an incredible inflation that we haven't felt yet in the middle classes. But the people in the rich, really rich people, they felt it, but they don't care because they have so much money now, it doesn't really matter. Do you want, to, do you want me just to just elaborate a little bit on what I just said? So, here's the pyramid, where the really rich people at the top, and the middle class, and then the people at the, the bottom have no money. The states pushes in billions of dollars uh, into the system, and the, to the banks. And, the, and they say, you've got to push liquidity into the markets. So we give you this money. We save the banks by giving them liquidity. The banks said, put the liquidity into the markets. And they say, okay, we're going to give it out to everybody who can show that they have assets they can borrow against. So you have one billion in real estate, you borrow one billion, and you invest that at a 10% increase because, because of the liquidity, everything's been going crazy for 12 years. So they make 12, up to, in 12 years, 10% a year, interest on interest, they now have gazillions, three billion here. The middle class, well, best case, we got a new kitchen. These guys down here, they got nothing. So 20 years ago when I bought my Ferrari, it was an, for two and a half million Swedish kroners, it was in every newspaper in Sweden. Today they, they sell 600 Ferraris, Maseratis, uh, McLarens and whatever for over six million kroners a year in Sweden. When we went out and really celebrated hard, we went down to the restaurant, we drank Moët de Chardon. Today they stand and they actually just pour Dom Pignon and Cristal. I used to fly first class over the Atlantic. Now they have their own airplanes flying over. This group has had a tremendous inflation. I bought a house in Verbier for 40 million Swedish kroners. I sold it for 40 million kroners. It cost 250 million today. This group has had an amazing inflation and that is all gonna sip it down and then we're all ruined. And the libertarians know this. They said, we're not going to have any governments that bails out the banks, who are the crooks that created the problem in the first place, give the money to the people who definitely don't need it. So they wanted a currency that they controlled, that there would be no inflation that they did not know in ahead of that would be. So it's impossible to stop. These guys now sit on a huge amount of money. The second group are the witches. Who are the witches? 20 years ago, they played World of Warcraft. Um, they dressed in black suits, painted their nails black, black hair, and they played role games on the streets. And then they went home with the computers and they played more World of Warcraft. And they bought a digital knife for $100 that they two weeks later sold for $500 million, for $500. They were the first ones to understand that you can make real money on digital value creation. And that is huge. Because when this, the group of people that talk about that, they talk slightly about gamification. You know, we need to have gamification. But they don't fundamentally understand what it means because they don't really play these games. But when you do, when you integrate all this, when you integrate video gaming and all of these, you'll find tens of thousands of jobs creating billions of value, real value, in the real system. Because what's happened also between people, with individuals, is that we have before and after 2000. We are digital immigrants and they are digital natives. And I can tell you, um, what do you call them? Um, psychologists in my age say that human beings cannot do uh, simultaneous work. We can't do different things at the same time. 
But I've also been told since I was a kid that only, we only use 4% of our brain capacity. The rest of our brain is not really functioning and we don't really need it. Of course we need it where it is, but you know, we don't really use it. I can promise you that my kids can do simultaneous, they really can do several different things simultaneously. I am 100% sure that the kids of this generation, their brains have mutated. Sorry? They have the name Indigo children. Indigo children. Yeah. They have more than 4% capacity of their brains. And they experience their digital lives as true as we experience us, ours. Because I have in the last two years, I've spent maybe two, maybe 300 hours learning to play PUBG. PUBG is players unknown battlegrounds. I'm worthless. <laughs> Because playing, playing uh, video games, you become improved until you're 21. You can keep it until you're 24. After 24, you get worse and worse and worse. Mm -hmm. At the age of 56, it's impossible. But I have been committed to, I'm going to learn enough to be able to play with my kids. They're 18 and 20. So you can play squar squar four people together against other four groups of people, which means we always take in a, a fourth person. Could be a Chinese, Ukrainian, a Polish, French. And when they interact with them, I've come to the understanding that their digital experience of life is absolutely as real to them as our meeting is here. We say that you've got to go out and play, you've got to meet people, you've got to, that's always going to... No. My grandmother told my mother, you can't sit with the radio all day, bloody rock and roll. Uh, my mother said to me, Joan, you can't sit by the television all day. And uh, I hate this bunka, 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 bunka. And I screamed to my kids, you can't sit by your computer. It's evolution. And the evolution that these guys have gone through is the world has always become better because the younger generations are always better. We know that we are better than our parents. We treat them as kids at the end because we know we're so much better. It's difficult for us, though, to, ac to accept the fact that our kids are better than us. But they are. And the, f the future is saved through them. Hmm. I think that's all I have to say. Don't forget to Twitter, LinkedIn, and whatever else if you like this. Selfie. And, it, and if you, you can take selfie. I'll stay here and talk to you. You can take pictures with me. And if you want to follow me, I'm always Johan uh, Stahl, in one word. Ah, I'll put it up here. On Instagram and um, whatever else. Snapchat. And um, feel free to talk to me now. I'll be here for a while. Flowers. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank you.